All right, good morning, everybody. It is 10.02. I'm two minutes late here this morning. Been rushing around, trying to get things done. But we are in 1 John, chapter number two today. We began the chapter, or the book rather, yesterday, and had a very short chapter with only 10 verses. Today will not be the same. There are 29 verses in chapter number two, so I guess John uh, felt like he needed to make up for some lost time. I don't know. But turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter number 2 this morning, and we're going to get into it. I enjoy the book of 1 John immensely. When I was newly saved, it was recommended to me that I read this book. And I'll tell you, it's a pretty convicting book. And so for a new Christian to read it is, uh, is a lot to take in, although it seems as though that's what John had intended also. When he talks about my little children, he's talking about his converts. And if you're going to call them little children, you're probably insinuating that they're young and they're new Christians. And so here we go. He just doesn't play any games with it. He gets right after uh, the truth here. So let's do the same thing. Let's pray and we will begin. First John chapter 2. Lord, we love you and we ask your blessing on our study this morning. We've been asking the last several days for knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. And we know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so we look to your word today in order to get that which we need. You also tell us that if any of us lack wisdom, we can ask you for it. And we do that today. Please speak to our hearts in Christ's name. Amen. All right, 1 John chapter 2. Now make sure you're not in the Gospel of John, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but go all the way to the end of your New Testament, Revelation, and then start backing up, and you'll run into the epistles of John. Here we go, 1 John chapter 2, verse number 1. My little children. See there, we start right off the bat. These things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So he says, look, I'm writing you these things to keep you from sin. I don't want you living in sin. I don't want you choosing sin over right. But if you do slip up, if you do make a mistake, if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. An advocate is like a lawyer, a mediator, someone who would go to the Father on our behalf and say, Father, I realize that they've sinned against you, but remember that I died in their place for their sin, and so my blood covers that. And so he goes between the Father and us, the Lord Jesus Christ does. But at the same time, the goal is not to sin, not to just rely on the advocate. Oh, I'll go ahead and do this because my advocate Christ, he'll, he'll get me out of it. That's not the right mentality. Verse 2. And he is the propitiation, what a word, for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Propitiation means payment. Jesus is the substitute. He is the payment for our sins, and not just ours, but look here, for the sins of the whole world. There is a doctrine out there called Calvinism. Some folks refer to it as hyper-Calvinism. And the teaching of Calvinism is that God didn't choose for anyone to be saved, but only those that he handpicked to be saved. Uh, they call them the elect, and there is a doctrine of election in the Bible, but they're, they're twisting it and not making it biblical in its nature. But what we're finding here, when you read passages like this, how can you deny that Christ was offered for every single man? And it's all throughout the New Testament. And here it is, not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And an, a Calvinist would say, well, that means the whole world that is elect. You can't twist the scripture like that. It doesn't work. Verse 3, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. This is interesting. Let's keep reading. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And so here's his, yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, you don't live like a Christian. Oh, it doesn't matter. I, I know him. 
Well, John here says, if you say you know him, but you don't keep his commandments, you're a liar. You don't know him. You know, that's like uh, my, my children saying, yeah, that's my dad. Well, why don't you do anything that he says? Well, you know, I, 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 he's my dad. Don't worry about it. Uh, you, you'd say, well, I don't know if that's true or not. You don't act anything like the family. You know, my kids look like my wife and I, and they even behave like other members of our family and, and, each, and my wife and I. They, they're obviously from our family because they behave like we behave. When you're from the family of God, you behave like the children who are part of the family of God. You don't behave like the devil's children if you're a part of the family of God. If you say you're a part of the family of God, but you behave like the devil's family, you're a liar and you're not saved and you're not a Christian. Verse number five, but whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. So there is a, a uh, ah, what's the word I want here? There is a, a, an affirmation or a confirmation that we're the children of God when we behave according to his word. Whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Verse six, he that saith he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. So if you say you abide in Christ, but then you walk contrary to the way Christ walked, well, then you're not his. If you say you abide in Christ and then you walk according to how he walked, then yes, then you are uh, uh, one of his. Verse 7, brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. So he starts off saying that I'm just telling you things that you've already heard. I'm telling you things that you already know. And then he says, if you do hear something new from me, it's new to you. He's not writing new commandments here. Verse 9, he that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth, because the darkness hath blinded his eyes. And so personal relationships come into it. He's been talking about, hey, you know, if, if you're saved, this is the way saved people behave. And if you don't behave this way, you behave differently, you're probably lost. Or at best, you're not walking in Christ. You're not abiding in Christ. Because people who are saved and who are abiding in Christ, they don't live like everybody else lives. They live differently. And then, it, for instance, if you hate your brother, you walk in darkness. What do you say here? Verse uh, 9, he that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He says, say what you want. But your attitude and your behavior is a more realistic gauge of what you truly are. You know, if, if, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck and has feathers like a duck and a bill like a duck, it's a duck. But if it's got the, the I don't know, the beak of a crow and the black feathers of a crow, then it's a crow. You can't say you're a Christian and then behave nothing like a Christian and be one. Just not, those two things don't go together. Verse 12, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. And he goes through the groups of people that could be reading this epistle and to whom he's speaking. And he 
tells them that the reason he's investing in them is because of the faith that they've shown. Let's look through it again. I write unto you, little children, verse 12, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I'm writing to you because you're one of Christ. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. You've known God. I write unto you, young men, because you've overcome the wicked one. Young people tend to wrestle most with carnality and 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 uh, tempted to sin. The devil's after young people like he's not after older people, although he never gives up on any of us, but the temptations are different. I write unto you little children because you've known the Father. I write unto you fathers, verse 14, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Verse 15, these next three verses are, are just absolutely uh, of supreme importance to the Christian. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Somebody asked me to define the world a few years ago, and I came up with this definition. It's coming from the top of my head. I'm going to try to remember it. The world is anything that you desire that you're willing to put ahead of Christ. That's the world. So the world is anything that you would desire to have that you'd put in front of Christ. So let's look at it again. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So let's say that... Uh, I aspired to reach the top of my company, and I was willing to put aside my relationship with God, my personal devotional life, my church attendance, my church service, even uh, even my personal convictions. Hey, if you uh, you, you know, we want to get this client, so why don't you take him out for a night on the town and live it up with them? If I'm willing to put my Christianity aside in order to do those things, to climb the corporate ladder, then I love the world. I love the world more than I love God. And so my job has become the world. Verse 16 tells us what the world is composed of. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So let's define these three things. The lust of the flesh is anything that you can engage in that gratifies your physical flesh. So gluttony, immorality, slothfulness, those things are the lust of the flesh. Uh, I, I will just indulge my flesh at the expense of my Christianity right? So that's the lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes is covetousness. Everything that I see that I want. I want that new car. I want that new house. I want that new outfit. I want a pile of money in the bank. You know, maybe you want to open your bank account on your internet browser and see, uh, see a large number. That's lust of the eyes too, isn't it? And so if you're willing to put those things ahead of the Lord, that's the world. And then the pride of life. The pride of life is about achievement or accomplishment or fame, notoriety, being known. You know, I, I, I really want to hit one million Instagram followers. That's the pride of life. I really want uh, 100,000 people to read my blog. Well, that's the pride of life. You know, what's my goal in doing this every day, by the way? Why am I doing it? Am I doing it so that I get a following? If so, that's the pride of life. It's not that I should be interested in a following as much as I should be interested in pointing people to Christ. Now, this, these three things, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, they show up in the Garden of Eden when Eve is tempted to eat the fruit. And remember what is told her about it. She sees the fruit and she decides the tree is good for food. Not the tree, but the fruit. The fruit is good for food. That's lust of the flesh. Pleasant to the eyes. That's lust of the eyes. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. Personal accomplishment. That's the pride of life. So the very first sin in the Garden of Eden involved these three things. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, the world. By the way, Satan has no new tricks. 
Every trick that he's ever used, he continues to use. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, still in use. And that's what he's coming after you with. Verse number 17. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You know, there's going to come a time when that car you want so badly is just going to end up in the junkyard. And that house that you want so badly is probably going to be torn down and a bigger house put in its place. And that outfit that you want so badly is just going to end up in the goodwill bin or thrown away in the trash. This world has nothing permanent to offer. But living for God, that's the only thing that will abide forever. Verse 18. Little children, it is the last time and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So what is an Antichrist? Anything that is opposing Christ. There are Antichrists today, aren't there? Just as they were in John's time. And so we know that those who fight against good and righteousness, they are Antichrists. Verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So he's saying, you know, we've seen some people follow us for a while and walk with us. But then they turned away and went back to where they came from. And that just tells us that they never were of us. Those who are of us and who are walking the same direction with us, they don't depart. They stay with you for the long haul, to the end. And these, not that way. And so they depart. Verse number 20. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you, because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. That's deep, isn't it? Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ... He is Antichrist that denieth the, the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. And so we see that if you're going to know God, you've got to know him through his Son, Jesus Christ. And if you deny the Son, then you don't know the Father. If you accept the Son, then you have access to the Father. Verse 24 let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. It's a good promise, isn't it? These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence, and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that every one that doeth righteousness is born of him. And so he's just reiterating here with his converts, uh, those who are new to Christ, that abiding in Christ will keep them from being seduced by those who would try to lead them astray. Abiding in Christ will keep them strong and on the right path. Abiding in Christ will help them when they see the Lord to be glad that they are seeing him and not refraining uh, from him. I talked about it in church a little bit yesterday, where when a child disobeys mom and dad, that child will avoid mom and dad because they don't want to face them over their behavior. Likewise, the Christian who's disobedient and uh, uncooperative with the Lord, rebellious against God, they don't want to face the Lord. They know they're going to have to give an answer for their behavior and for themselves, for their choices, and uh, they don't want to see him. And so, do right. Abide in Christ. Hey, this right here, every single day, getting a chapter in your head and in your heart, it'll change you. Uh, the things that we see and hear will change who we are. And so this is important, and you're doing the right thing. Stay in the Word of God. Stay close to Christ. 
pray every day. Have some time of prayer and then pray without ceasing throughout the day. Abide in the Lord. All right, that's all I got for you. 20 minutes here now. Thanks for watching. Please like, love, share the post, not because I'm trying to fulfill the pride of life, but we're just trying to help people and trying to encourage people and trying to uh, help them get a walk with God going. All right, I'm going to leave you alone. Pray for us. We're heading down to Indiana, taking a couple teenagers down to see a Bible college, and uh, we're going to be there tonight and then all day tomorrow. So tomorrow's not going to be 10 o'clock. Tomorrow's going to be much earlier than that. I don't even know how early, maybe 7, 7.30, something like that, like we've done in the past on Sundays or every Sunday. <laughs> so anyhow, I'm going to leave you alone. Thanks for watching. God bless you. Happy Monday. Have a great week.